So, Bob, I have a case here that was sent to me from my malpractice Ah. in which it describes a real story of a counselor that was successfully sued. Anyone we know? Uh (laughs) <laughs> you know, they, they always anonymize all of it. Sure, of course they do. So I, I don't know. Something bad happened to them because they did something bad. So I want to get into that with you. What do you say, Bob? Yeah, let's hear it. These kinds of things happen a lot, you know, and that's what I want to get into as well is like, there's a lot of things that this counselor does that are fairly common, particularly more recently. It's a, it's a trend that's mm. been happening. Uh-oh. So let's get into it. But first, I want to remind everyone that Bob is on Cameo. Oh. And I don't think I promote it enough. So if any of y'all want to get a Cameo from Bob or from Umberto or Rebecca, you can get a personalized happy birthday or a little pep talk or happy anniversary or whatever. Uh, Bob will My condolences on your ethical violation. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Also, I want to tell everyone that we're going to have our 16th anniversary live show in September. I can't remember the exact date, but I'll announce that at some point. And it'll be the same as we've been doing. So we'll do 17 or 16 hours, eight hours one day, eight hours another day. And if y'all want to send in your cards or your packages or your art or your gifts for anybody... Uh, for Bob, for Berto, for Rebecca, for Stacy, for my dogs, for me, for all of us, um, you can do so. You can go to our website, psychologyseattle.com, and it has our address at the bottom of the of the front home page, and you can mail that in. What I'd love to get is fan art. I love fan art, <laughs> even if it's just a line drawing, like a stick, you know, stick drawing. Yeah, your door is full of fan art. I know. I just love it. And if you could. Uh, include yourself in the fan art. Oh. You know, a lot of people will just draw my face or something, which is great, but I have a lot of that. So if you can include Bob in there, uh, Umberto, Rebecca, my uh, my wife, my my dogs, whatever, yourself, I, I would love that. And you can send that in. And I might put it even on my wall. I have fan art actually... On my office wall. What if they want to do a Lego bust of you? A Lego bust? Of uh, you. Yeah, that'd be quite a shipping expense. But <laughs> Okay, so this is presented by my malpractice, which is HPSO or CNA. It's also NSO. But anyway, so let's begin. We have a 30-year-old male client. 30-year-old male client contacted a licensed counselor to request marriage counseling. Right. So nothing squirrely yet. Right? Yeah, right. The client reported that he had a history of situational depression and anxiety, and he was not taking any medications. So a client calls a counselor, I'm looking for marital counseling for me and my partner, and I have a history of, quote unquote, situational depression and anxiety. What do you think that would possibly mean? It means that there's something happening in that person's life that is making them anxious. And if you're anxious long enough, depression just seems to follow. They're like two sides of a coin. Uh, And this presentation is very common. Because if they're coming for marital therapy, that's a situation that'll cause lots of tension, lots of anxiety, and can lead to depression. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. All right. So because the counselor was not licensed in the state where the client resided, the counselor was unable to provide counseling. So this is happening more and more as we're able to advertise ourselves on the internet, which is available all over the country and the world. You know, in the old days, you would just look up in the yellow pages, literally, or you'd get a referral from your insurance. Or maybe a friend. Or a friend that you worked with. And again, you would only know people that lived in your town because you, you weren't on the internet all the time. And so the chance of even knowing of a professional that was in a different state was pretty rare. Unless they were like a famous person, you know, like Yalom maybe. Yeah, right. A famous therapist. Right. 
but even then you wouldn't know how to contact them. <laughs> so, uh, but now well, for a lot of therapists, um, I, it's not unusual for them to get a lot of requests. Maybe a majority of the requests are from people from out of state. I, I ask, and I'm, I'm very clear with people, you actually have to be standing somewhere inside the borders of Washington state at the time of the service in order for us to meet and for me to be protected by my liability insurance. Meaning that they can't just have a residence in Washington oh, or yeah, a mailing no. address in Washington. People will argue with me about that occasionally. Like, well, yeah, but I, you know, I live it. Yeah. Well, that doesn't really matter to my liability insurance carrier. Are these fans of the podcast? No, no, no. Just, just regular folk that, you know, are looking for, um, you know, but how would help. they know about you? Why would they contact you? Oh, because they live in Seattle, but they're going to be like the last time this happened, they were going to be out of state for some extended period of time and, you know, wanted to start therapy and, um, but they weren't in the state at the time and they were planning to return. That's what they said. I think they lived in Hawaii. Um, so the plan was to come back to Washington and then, you know, start and you know before the pandemic we just saw people in person so this was really a non non-event because it's not like you were going to see somebody who was in hawaii you know they got to show up in your office but now that now that um, so many people use zoom and and the like this comes up more and more so you don't know where somebody is sitting when you're having therapy you they say i'm in washington state I take them at their word because, you know, that's a silly thing to lie about. And there's reason to think that it's, you know, that it's fine. Um, but I don't know where anybody is. Right. They might be an extended in an extended vacation to see their in-laws or something right. for a couple of months. Right. Given that people can work online and there's a lot of mobility these days. There was reciprocity between states for a while during the pandemic, but I, has that been revoked? You know, I don't know because I don't supervise anymore. And I, I used to know all these details and it's changing so much and it changes from state to state. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know, but I do know that there's a lot of issues around this and it's really just kind of silly because if you have a driver's license, you don't need a license in every state of the union to drive across the United States. Every state acknowledges the driver's licensing process and every, and cause every state has its own driver's licensing process. You know what I mean? It's not a federal thing. So in the same way, you could easily have a license to practice that is just rec – why would Florida not recognize a Washington state license to practice as a clinician? <laughs> you know? They all have almost the identical – most of the states have either identical or nearly identical requirements. As they, as they ought to. The requirements that are, that are out there are reasonable requirements. Yeah. California is the only one that's anomalous, but it could be argued that 98% of the requir requirements are the same there as well. Yeah. It's just in the past, you didn't need it to be that way. Right. And since these things are so slow to move. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's interesting that you're running into that. I, I didn't know that you'd be running into that. It's rare, but it happens. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll get arguments. People will be like, no, that's not how it works. I heard that it's okay. And you're like, no. But I but I live in Washington. I am actually a Washington resident. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know. And yeah, I, I don't know the, the ins and outs of this. And I think a fair amount of it hasn't been adjudicated yet. Yeah. Meaning that there isn't a court precedent or some precedent from the board around the, uh, you know, the kind of tertiary examples of this. I mean, there, so this gets into an actual event that leads to a definitive result, but oh. there are a lot of situations like, you know, like, like I remember when I used to do this kind of work and supervise and needed to be aware very closely of the law and the changes that it was unclear if you had a client say in person in Seattle and they went on a vacation for a week and they were in Hawaii. And by the way, you say Hawaii, right. Uh, which is strange as a white person. <laughs> how, how do other people say it? Or as a, as a, someone not from Hawaii. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. so I, I am not from Hawaii, so I can't say it exactly the way you're supposed to say it, but the way that it's typically said 
mainland United States is Hawaii. Like there's a there's a Y in there, Hawaii, right? But it's Hawaii. Yeah. There's a glottal stop, or I don't know what you call it, but there's a little Ooh, gap. But you did love that. it. I don't know if it's a glottal stop, but well, uh, I know, but it's one of those I watch, jargony things I love. Well, I watch a lot of uh, linguistic YouTube channels. Do you really? Yeah, I love it. There's a lot of really good YouTube channels that talk about accent and about the derivation well, of, wor- of I, words. Oh, I love all that stuff. I gotta, I'm, I'm expanding my horizon. Oh yeah, huge, huge YouTube channels. Okay. There's some really big figures. I, I don't know their names, but <laughs> um, all right. So, 30 year old male client contacted a licensed counselor to request marital counseling. The client reported that he had a history of situational depression and he was not taking any medications. Because the counselor was not licensed in the state where the client resided, he was unable to provide counseling. So what you would do, Bob, in a situation like this would say, sorry, I can't work with you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what this guy did Mm. is he offered the client remote life coaching services. Oh, that's getting gray. Any thoughts on that? Well... You got to be careful, man, because someone can make the case that there isn't any difference between what you do as a coach and what you do as a therapist. So I think it's risky unless you have educated yourself about what is the difference between the two and can articulate that to a lawyer, say, or um, a, a ethics board or to the client themselves. Because people seeking help, they don't give a shit what you call yourself. You're a coach, you're a therapist, you're whatever. You know, we don't we don't care about what people call themselves. We care for help. We we want help. So whatever they call themselves uh, is what they call themselves. So yeah. Yeah. I did a whole episode detailing the landscape and the debate and the problems and the trends and the bad trends regarding therapists providing life coaching services. So you can listen to that other episode, but in short, there, as you said, there's a problem with people thinking that with minimal education, they can manage that line. Also, it's unclear if in the future this will even be allowed because of various reasons. One, of, one being that how can you possibly expect a mental health clinician to know how to, uh, you, you have to hold back as a clinician, you can't engage in 90% of what you know and 90% of your skills. You can't even begin to engage in that because you're engaging in counseling in a clinical service. Yep. Also, you would have to continually remind the client that you're not operating as a counselor, and you'd have to draw a lot of boundaries potentially with clients that would raise questions or ask for things that you would have to say, I'm sorry, since this is life coaching, I can't get into that. And that's hard. You know, imagine the client's like, but you can help me with this. So why aren't you helping? And you, I'm sorry, I, I ethically, I can't do that here. That's expecting a lot. And as uh, the, it, so the other thing was the, is to ask ourselves, why would a therapist even do this in the first place? Like, why would they open themselves up even to what cuz you know i imagine most counselors understand there's a little bit of a liability there right i would argue there's a huge liability there oh yeah but most people understand there's at least some liability so why would someone open themselves up to that liability maybe they needed money right it's money that it's got to be the only reason <laughs> right. right yeah cuz they they have a choice between not getting money and fudging the rules and getting money well they're going to fudge the rules and get money yeah. now i did in this episode go over how counselors can provide life coaching services legitimately. I looked into this and actually had a whole analysis of this whole thing. It's rare, but there are examples of people that are doing it right. They are ethical. They they do draw those boundaries. They do have a lot of informed consent. They understand where the line is. Um, and they are frequently having to remind their clients some of them will advertise themselves on a separate website as a life as a life coach and when those those clients come to them they don't even tell them they don't even tell those clients that they are also a counselor because that's the other issue is that if a client 
you know, reasonably believes that you're operating as a counselor, even though you would say you're not, then that still can be a problem because you're up, you know, it, it, it's a matter of reasonability of understanding. And you can't just in the beginning say in this legalistic way, everything I do with you is life coaching. You should know that sign of the dotted line. You know, a year later, you can't rely on that as a, as a surefire way to defend yourself in a court of law, you know, or in the licensing board or something. So anyway, there, there, there are examples of people that do it well and ethically, Mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people that are just like willy nilly going into this. And this is a, this is one of those bad cases. Mm, Yeah, I wouldn't do it. We don't know what motivated the counselor to say, I'll do life coaching, but I would imagine it had to do with money. Which I, you know, can understand. Hey, and that—that's what a lot of people will say. It's like, hey, it's hard to make a living as a counselor these days, or sometimes, and so you got to diversify. And what I say is, that's not my experience. <laughs> the people that I work with in the beginning of their career, if if they make the right moves, then you know they they start making a good living. I mean, you, you could, after two or three years, you could gross one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars a year. It's not super easy. It requires some go-gettedness and some good marketing, and, and you have to be a good therapist to some extent. But more importantly, you have to be a good marketer and a good business person. Mm-hmm. You know, even if you're doing half as well as that, you know, that's not terrible money. Yeah. Also, even if it were the case that it was hard for 90% of counselors to make a, a livable wage and pay off their student loans, that doesn't give you the right to harm clients. No. <laughs> You know, that's not a fucking excuse. Uh, then, you know, change other things about our industry, like reimbursement or something. Uh, don't just... And the other the other issue is it dilutes our profession, I think. It makes us look like we're all hacks. Yeah. If we can just, like, throw away... Because life coaches have zero requirements. Right. Uh, uh, you know, a 10-year-old can call themselves a life coach. Yeah. No joke. Mm-hmm. Of course they can. And yeah. and sell their services, uh-huh. uh, so it, it's a, it's a it, it makes us look like the way a lot of people see us, which is that we're uh, we're not really a profession, you know, we're just a bunch of like paid best friends or something, you know. Right. Um, going on as a part of his practice, the counselor advertised that he did offer life coaching as an alternative to counseling for out of state clients, so. This was a policy of his that he was publicly stating. It's just asking for trouble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. It, it, it just, it, it, if, if he had a separate website that said, I offer life coaching, and a separate website that said, I offer counseling, then right. that's what I'm a thing. life coach. I'm a counselor. I'm a life coach for out-of-state people. Right. But I'm not a life coach for in-state people? No, then I'm a therapist. Right. Wow, that's specialized, sort of. I mean, that just sounds like bullshit. Right. Yeah. So this suggests that this was not the first time he had done this. Yeah, right, of course. The advertisement included a disclaimer indicating that the life coaching services were not reimbursable by health insurance. Oh, yeah. Um, All right. So the client agreed with this plan and signed a written contract to proceed with life coaching. Was life coaching going to be with their spouse? So uh, I don't know if they go into this, but it becomes individual. Okay. But you're right. It was initially a a marital thing. Right. Marital counseling thing. And at some point, they decided to do individual. Oh, he's not a marriage coach? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So there's a contract, Uh and it has to do with life coach. I didn't get to see this contract exactly, but I'm guessing it probably has something in there about this is not actual counseling. Some Some kind of informed consent. Some kind of informed consent. However, the counselor did not engage in a detailed informed consent discussion regarding the limitations of life coaching and how it differed from counseling. Yeah. So this is an issue that I would go over with my supervisees in detail, which is that you can't just rely on the written contract as adequate informed consent because most people just glance it over and or they don't really understand what they're reading. And or you could argue even if they did understand and did read it, it's not fully being absorbed. So there are certain things that I would require my supervisees and I would do myself to verbally go over with their clients, maybe multiple times over a number of sessions. 
particularly around confidentiality, right? Because they could look at the confidentiality section on your informed consent and comprehend it, but do they really get it? Is it really being highlighted to them? You know, so it's it's very important. And I would argue, or I would guess, and there's research on this, and I don't know the stats, but I would take a guess and say that 90% of clients don't even really read it when they sign when they sign it. Oh, if not more. Yeah, because you know those forms you fill out when you go to the dentist or the I, doctor. I never read them. Yeah, you're just like, yeah, I'm sure. It's I'm it's sure fine. I get the gist. You know? Yeah. But therapy, there are some very. You could argue the informed consent process and therapy is like a hundred times more important uh-huh. for the client to understand than when you go to the dentist. Yeah, for a few different reasons. Yeah. One having to do with life and death. You don't have to worry about that with the dentist, and the other one having to do with um, privacy. I don't really care who knows anything about my teeth. Right. You know, right. Exactly. Blab all you want, yeah. dentist. Even right. though you know they do have the they have the the confidentiality rules, it's just not that important to Plus, us. Plus, the things you will disclose upon yeah. a dentist visit are nothing compared to the things you will disclose yeah. in a therapy. Office. I hope not. Yeah, I have an abscess. <laughs> also, where do you submit complaints? You know that kind right. of stuff. You know, right. There's, there's yeah. a lot in record keeping. There's a lot of things yep. that need to be fully understood by mm-hmm. a client, mm-hmm. and in order for you to sleep at night and operate ethically you need to really make sure your clients get it which might require revisiting you know one of the things that i would do with clients say six months into therapy they will start to you know say i'm working with an adult and uh, six months into therapy they're like they sit down on my couch and they're like oh i had a tough day and i'm like oh tell me what's going on like oh my kids they're just they're really just um a stress in my life right now i will pause the client and remind them about my responsibility for mandated reporting of child abuse. I haven't heard anything about child abuse yet, no. but we haven't been in this zone of talking. So I suspect the client either forgot or needs to be reminded of my mandated reporting responsibilities. Right. That's my style. Mm-hmm. Some therapists will say, well, I informed them, so that should be enough. And I want to maybe even catch people if they are being abusive. Oh, I don't want that. There's a lot of therapists who are like that. I, I which don't which I don't know. which I don't argue against cuz mm-hmm. you know if you're highlighting or emphasizing child welfare then you know I, I can get behind that. Mm-hmm. But you and I are the sort of therapists that we want the clients to be behind the wheel. We mm-hmm. don't want them to be passengers. Mm-mm. So I'll I'll tell clients just to remind you yep. I'm not saying I don't I, I I can't imagine you abusing your kids but right. I just want to tell you that if you tell me anything that indicates any kind of abuse even if it's another kid that your kid knows you know if you tell me about one of your kids friends that you think is being abused by any any adult or anybody there's a chance that I will have to report that to CPS so I just want to remind you okay continue with your story um, you know I would imagine most therapists don't do that kind of stuff. But when a client engages in every minute of every session, they should be operating from informed consent. Informed consent isn't something you just get out of the way in the beginning. Informed consent is throughout treatment. (laughs) It is every minute of every session in perpetuity. It's not just a requirement that we inform them in the beginning and then whatever. Mm Mm-hmm. There was no detailed informed consent discussion. I don't know if that means that there was a little bit of discussion. I would suspect there was zero discussion because that's typically. And uh, specifically regarding the limitations of life coaching and how it differed from counseling. Right, that that's was, a that, big deal. That was not gone over. And of course, in a situation like this, since they reached out to you as a counselor, you would really want to go over that. At the very least, just so that you can have that basis of ground rules between you and the client. Presuming that you're thinking that there is a distinction between life coaching and counseling and not just this sort of, I'm going to get around the state rules. Right. Which is sounds like what this person does. Right. In addition, the counselor did not document a mental health assessment and plan as they were not required to do so because it was life, life, life mm. coaching. Right. So that's not unusual, but yeah. it's just a detail that they're including here. All right. Let's take a break. What do you say? Yeah, sure. All right, we're back from the break. Just a reminder, Bob is on Cameo. 
another reminder. <laughs> and if you want to send in <laughs> fan art or any sort of cards or gifts or anything that will open during the 16th anniversary show. All right, going on. So the coaching sessions begin, and they were initially conducted via video conferencing and were focused on the client's marital discord and career development. So hard to know what that means. Career development sounds more like life coaching. Marital discord, it's very likely if we saw those discussions, we would say that is a therapy session. That is not a life coaching section session. But it, it's hard to say sometimes with this you know, I don't know, going on. However, the client became more intolerant of the marital relationship and expressed a, de- a desire to quote unquote get away. Oh. Not unusual. Yeah. The client informed the counselor that he lost his job and could not afford to secure an apartment. So the count the client's like, I don't want to be in this marriage anymore. I want to get away. I lost my job and I can't move out. I can't afford, I can't get out and afford a place. Right. And the client stated that continuing to live with his spouse was exacerbating his depression and anxiety. Uh-huh. So where do you think this is headed? It's a suicide attempt. A uh, 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 Good guess, but that's not what happens. Oh, Any okay. other guesses? Because <laughs> I can't imagine you even guessing where this is headed, but... but Is it divorce? Did the, did the spouse sue? I'll, I'll say it again. Okay. The client wants to get away from his spouse, wants to move out, lost his job, can't afford it, telling the life coach these details. I want to get out. I can't afford a place. I want to get out. I, can't buy a sh- I don't know, but I can't. I don't actually Well, because your brain can't possibly go to where this life coach slash counselor did, which is to offer the client to move in with him. Whoa! Like, it, that didn't even enter your head, but... I imagine for many of the listeners, it might have entered their head because they're not clinicians and they haven't, oh. uh, uh, they, you know, they don't, because that would be at least a thought that you would have, right? If you had a yeah. a friend or something that was in a desperate state, you might offer to them your couch, right? I, I would, for but a friend. You would never offer a client, even life coaching, which is not recommended, but there is no ethical, there's no no, profession of life coaching. Right. So there are suggested ethics and there are suggested professional guidelines, but they're not, you know, adhered to and, and there's no real consensus, you know. What do you always say? You always say stupid is as stupid does. Right. So I get to that later, Bob, uh, but I'll get to that later. It's in my notes because I, I, I gave that some thought actually about that idiom, but so the counselor emphasized, uh, sorry, the counselor empathized yeah. with the client. Yeah. And in an effort to help him, the counselor invited the client to move into his home. <laughs> wow. But yeah, stupid is as stupid does. Yeah. Um, in exchange, so just to pause here, you have someone that is advertising, hey, if you are reaching out to me as a client and you don't live in my state, I also offer life coaching. So that already points in this direction that the person doesn't know what they're doing and is willing to overstep ethical guidelines for their own gain because they just want to, right? And that shows someone that doesn't understand or hasn't been taught or something the necessity of boundaries and of the frame and of professionality and not just doing whatever you fucking feel like doing. So the counselor is like, hey, how about you move into my place? To be clear, I don't think the client was asking for it. (laughs) Yeah, it's not indicated, huh? Right. But, you know, maybe it was something that was being thrown out there. Who knows? I I doubt a client would ever say, hey, can I live with you? Right. Yeah. Yeah. In exchange for living accommodations, because the client can't afford. Right. So can't pay rent in his place. Is he still paying the life coach fee? That's a good question. Uh Uh-huh. In exchange for the living accommodations, the counselor requested that the, the counselor requested that the client perform household chores and handyman services. Oh my, oh, 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 it's, it's humiliating. 
and embarrassing just to hear this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. So even if the client didn't move in and there was a bartering thing about chores and handyman services, why would that be a problem? Well, it's a dual relationship. You know, like, um, what do you do if the, if the, you become, a therapist becomes really vulnerable if they don't like the handyman's work. Like the plumbing is still fucked and I have a leak and now my, you know, I got to redo my whole bathroom, right? What are you going to do? Are you going to sue the client? If, the, you know, because they don't have, nobody who, who has, you know, $15,000 lying around um, to, you know, so, yeah. so like, as soon as you say you owe me money, you just opened yourself for a lawsuit. The reason therapists shouldn't chase for money is because it makes vulnerable for lawsuits. Don't don't let people get a balance. That's the thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. There are many other things to think about Oish. with bartering, but that's the main one. But you're talking about a counselor or a therapist. He's not operating as a counselor or a therapist. He's a life coach. Yeah. So all bets are off, right, Bob? Well, no. Why? You don't have a leg to stand on, and if it goes to court, you don't have a leg to stand on. What do you mean? Well, you can't you can't um, um, expect anybody to think that there's a distinction between the two, or expect that the client is going to understand that there's a distinction between the two. And you're licensed in the state where you're letting them live. Right. You're a th your website says you're a therapist for people in state. Right. So uh, some r reasonable people could claim that this is completely outside of counseling and therefore there are no ethical codes. Yeah, yeah. But you would have to be so good at covering your tracks to be able to pull this off, to be able to convince a judge or a jury that you had done enough to reasonably draw that line. Um, you know, because if it, if a judge or a jury did determine that this was done enough and the line was kept, then it then it's fine. Yeah, yeah it's it could be a bad business move or a bad life move mm -hmm. to have a life coaching client move into your house, but but it's not an ethical or right. legal concern because there are no ethics or laws around life coaching. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, so the only way this could work is if if the counselor was very buttoned up about that. Mm -hmm. But given everything we're hearing, what's your prediction as to whether or not the counselor... Oh, they're not buttoned up about this. They're not buttoned up going in. They're, they're unbuttoned. Right. Yeah. We don't know, but we'll find out. Yeah. Because that'll come out later. So as part of the quote-unquote bartering agreement, mm -hmm. the counselor indicated that he would provide in-person life coaching sessions to the client. So this was all over video in the past. So... Client moves in, presumably from out of state, into his house. Huge life change for the client. Right. Um, and they're like, okay, well, you do, you get to live in my house, but you have to do chores and you have to do handy band services. I've, you know, I've always wanted to renovate my basement. And in exchange for that, I'll provide my life coaching and it'll be in person. The client accepted the offer and moved into the counselor's home. Wow. He performed household services. And the counselor met with the client routinely to provide life coaching. All right. After several months, the relationship inappropriately became more personal. The counselor could no longer differentiate his role as to whether he was acting as a life coach or a counselor or a friend. So not only was the life coach blending with friend, because, you know, you live together, but also it was clear from the data eventually reviewed that there was a lot of counseling aspects, which they didn't lay out exactly, but what do you imagine that might have looked like? It's like having, you know, your therapist around all the time. But what would have, what could they have looked at that they would have said, that doesn't look like friend or life coach, that looks like counselor? Oh, um, meeting alone in a room and having a particular kind of focus like on depression or um, anxiety. Right. I mean, even if you're doing simple cognitive behavioral therapy, that's fucking therapy. <laughs> that's counseling. You, you can't do that as a life coach. You can't do CBT as a life coach, I would argue, going on. For example, the, the counselor would often refer to himself as a counselor <laughs> in email written communications with the client, but would also have personal interactions with the client on social media. Oh, so man. 
he's so stupid that in written communications, because you know God knows what's happening in person, he's emailing the client who lives with him and referring to himself as a counselor. Okay, I don't know what exactly was being said, but that was clear. Although the life coaching contract stated that the counselor would not communicate via email, there were numerous personal emails between the counselor and the client, including one in which the client expressed that he viewed their relationship as a friendship. So what this says to me is that not only is this counselor life coach not following his own guidelines about not emailing, but when the client is saying, hey, as a friend, could you help me out with this? The counselor is not pushing back on that in this written communication. So when eventually this is all reviewed, they have all these emails, but the emails are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's really happening verbally because that's not documented. It's not recorded. So they needed to look to the emails as to what might be happening in person. Anyway, at this point, the counselor realized that he had crossed boundaries and needed to extricate himself from the situation. So they didn't go into detail, but why would the counselor life coach suddenly realize that something was wrong? Like, what do you think happened? Because up until this point, it seems like the counselor doesn't have any concern about anything. And then all of a sudden, boom, the counselor is concerned. They got drunk together. They had sex. Uh, they used drugs. Um, they ventured into um, the counselor revealing per you know, personal stuff about, you know, like um, personal information. Uh, these, I don't know, which one? Yeah, I don't know either. Oh. But I suspect, given what we learn in a bit, that the client started to become over-involved and there was a conflict, emotional something. Sure. And the counselor realized either one or both of these things, either, you know, this is going too far, or I don't like the way this feels. I don't like the fact that there's now this person living in my house. I would rather have them not live in this house. I, I didn't really know them well enough to agree to this. Or, and, or, or, or to offer it. <laughs> yeah, right, to offer it. And I don't want to be in this relationship anymore. So, something like that. Sloppy. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know what happened. But I'm guessing it had to do something but with it. you hear stories like that where a counselor will extricate themselves because they've ignored a boundary and then have discovered that, you know, they don't like how things have unfolded. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a age-old problem. Right. Uh, usually it's not living with your client. Usually it's something <laughs> like you open the door to texting. Right. And then you realize, oh, this is, I, you know, I've gone too far. And then that... I would work with people and I would say, okay, well, now is the time to establish a policy that you apply to all clients, even the clients that don't need this policy. You you use this policy because you can't just have a policy that applies to one client <laughs> um, going on. He first informed the client, the counselor first informed the client, about, so this is the counselor is now deciding I need to extricate myself. He first informed the client about the importance of maintaining professional boundaries and made reference to the American Counseling Association Code of Ethics. Oh, geez, Louise, don't weaponize the damn thing. It's to protect you. It's a good word, weaponize, yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, now all of a sudden the Code of Ethics? The Code of Ethics does not apply to clients. <laughs> well, plus, it's a life coach situation. Oh, right, right, that's right. That's, I forgot. I forgot about that bit. So why, so this is, this is, very damning on him. Uh -huh. And presumably this is all over email or something, right? If if he's invoking the American Council of Association Code of Ethics, yeah. then you consider, you, not only are you acting as a counselor, but you consider yourself a counselor and you're weaponizing the counsel. And plus, the, the Code of Ethics is not something you use on a client. It's something you would adhere to you, yourself to. Clients do not have ethical responsibility. Right. You can't yell at a client and say, hey, this is unethical. You need to stop this. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do you think the client did? Oh, um, well, they if they got evicted, they sued that motherfucker. Well, what what would be just upon getting an email like this? Sounds like, you know, the, the counselor's just like, 
hey, we need to have professional boundaries and there's the American Counseling Association Code of Ethics, so we need to take a step back. Well, that was what, in an email? I don't know, but it was okay. some sort of communication along those lines. What do you think the client did in that moment? How, uh, do, you think, how do you think they felt about it? Oh, I think they were uh, confused or scared because now they're going to lose a place to live and livid. Right. The client responded with anger. Yeah. And was resistant to making any changes to the situation. <laughs> I think meaning, I'm not moving out. I'm or, not moving out. Or something. Well, you know, the, the landlord-tenant rules are really in favor of tenants. They're yeah. protecting tenants because landlords have a lot of power already. Right. So, woof, this is so messy. Right. And it could be argued that it isn't a landlord-tenant situation because there right. is no lease agreement. Oh, that's right. Good point. Good point. It's a essentially a family member. It's right. a friend, right? A friend. Someone yeah, now informal. lives with you. Right. <laughs> um, I don't know how that kind of works, but anyway. Several days later, well, let's take a break and we get back. Let's let's continue with this training. Sure. Work. All right, back from the break. So several days later, after the counselor tries to draw this boundary, the counselor consulted with a colleague who was also a professional counselor. What do you think about that? Um, I wonder if they understood anything well enough to know how humiliating it would be to reveal this to another therapist. Mm. Like, like if, I, if somebody said this to me, I would be horrified. As, they, a, as a consultant? As a, yeah, like if they said, hey, can I talk to you about something that's going right. on in my world? Yeah, because typically it'd be like, I have a client that I'm struggling with. Right because it seems like the husband doesn't really like me right. or something like that. Right. I talk to you about that stuff, yeah. you know, fairly frequently. Not, I'm living with... <laughs> yeah, right. I'm living with... And they won't leave. <laughs> right. Yeah. The other thing I think is, oh, now you consult? Right. Right. Like, what, what did they think was going to happen? Well, also... You should have consulted so long ago. Oh, oh, oh. Before you put up your website, you should have had a consultation. Before you decided to become a therapist, Oof. you should have consulted. Yeah, right. So what do you think the colleague ultimately advised? What, what do you think they said the counselor should do? Well, let me ask this. Does, do therapists have a duty to report um, when they see an ethical violation? There's... A lot of gray zone here, but we have an obligation, you and me, to do something if the ethical violation is of a certain class, you know, if it's of a certain intensity. The first thing we should consider doing is going directly to the clinician. But if it's beyond a certain level, like if the clinician is having sex with their clients mm -hmm. or doing mm -hmm. something like this... Mm -hmm then it could be argued, but there's not a lot of court precedent around this or board precedent around this, it, but it could be argued that you not only should be telling the counselor that's unethical, but you should be telling the licensing board yourself and you could be held liable if you don't. But I have never heard of a situation where a consultant was held responsible for not reporting to the board. So I think it's just one of those gray zone areas that people have a lot of opinions about, but there's not any hard and fast rule. I would say that morally speaking, well, would you think that morally speaking, this morally meaning client protection, you could say that's ethical, but I'm emphasizing the moral human aspect of this. Do you think that consultant had a moral responsibility to inform the board? It depends if it were me, it would depend on what the person does with our consultation and whether or not they take any action. But the damage is already done. Well, know? that's a great point. Like, it's not pre-decision. Something's already been happening. And it shows so... Because it's not just one decision that this oh, counselor yeah. made. No, no, no. It's hundreds of decisions. Right, right, and right. And decision tree moments and flowchart moments and whys in the road that this counselor decided to go down the road of horribleness. This exhibits a deficit of a high, of a high degree in this counselor. And you're only hearing about one of the clients. God fucking knows what this fucker is doing with so right, many other people. The rest of their case. Yeah. Caseload. Like what's the chance that 
all the other clients are totally buttoned up and everything's like perfect. No. It's almost no How many out of state clients do they life coach? Yeah. Right. You know, that didn't move in with him, right. <laughs> but are being treated as clients yeah. in an unethical way, you know? So I don't know what I do. I have to say, it's not a slam dunk that I would report them to the ethics board. I would probably, if it was, I would probably call you and then I call our lawyer and ask questions. Yeah, I hadn't thought about this, but what I would do is, I yeah, I might, I might call my own lawyer, yeah. as you said, yeah. but I would consider telling you know. I'm just trying to imagine it. it this is probably some sort of friendship, co- collegial. I'm guessing that right. this counselor. That's what did. I'm thinking. Is like somebody comes to me. It's probably I know them personally. Right. Yeah. So if that were the case and someone came to me and I cared about them <laughs> and it wasn't just an anonymous situation, I, I I could see myself taking a risk and saying, look, I'm going to tell you what my advice is and I'm going to document all this, by the way. <laughs> I might even record the conversation and I would inform them. I'm like, I'm only talking to you if we can record this because there's a high chance that this is going to end up in court and I need to protect myself. And I'm not going to report this to the board, but if you don't report yourself, I am going to consider reporting myself. But I recommend that you actually preempt, because this is almost certainly going to end up being reported to the board or as a high chance, and you don't have any leg to stand on as far as I can tell. So you might as well get out ahead of this and make yourself look good and turn yourself in. And if you don't do that, I might, I might feel like I have to, um, I, I care about you and I like you, but I also care about my career. Also care about the public welfare. And I care about the public welfare. And I, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't consider our friendship to be on the level that I want to risk harming the public and, and my own livelihood. You know I, what I mean? love that sentence. <laughs> I love you. I don't consider our friendship to be on the level that I won't consider. And if you break up with me as a friend because I do something that I consider to be quite reasonable, I mean, like I might even tell my friend that dumps this on me, I might say like, fuck you for dragging me into this because now I have to make a choice as to whether or not I do something that ruins our friendship or risks harming my career. You've now put me in a bind. You've now triangulated me into your bullshit. Like, why did you tell me about this? You could have, you know, not told me. You could have told someone else or called a, a lawyer or something, you know, because that's a, that would be a, comp- you know, lawyers don't they, have they don't, a responsibility. They don't. Yeah, to, no, they have responsibility to. But, you know, thanks for like dragging me into this. Now I'm part of it. And I, I don't know what to do, you know? Like, I might actually say that too. Right. And um, that would be a reasonable response. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, what, but let's say that this counselor mm-hmm. hangs out with some other counselors that also don't know what they're doing to varying degrees. What, well, oh, wow. What would be a simplistic response? You don't live online the way I do, but there's a very simplistic response that I see all the time to almost any situation that this consultant advised. Can you imagine what that is? Okay, let's see. You know, imagine this guy like posts this on on the internet anonymously. What do you think would be the a, a common response? Wouldn't a common response? I think it would be people saying, are you a moron? <laughs> in addition to that. <laughs> Is that a bad way to put it? I don't know. No, no. No, okay. Um, in addition to that, uh, okay. I don't know if this is right. Is It's your home. <laughs> so you get to choose who lives in it. So you, yeah, you have a right to kick them out. Right. It's along those lines. The, the very common response that I see online to pretty much any situation is terminate the client. Terminate the client. Right. Of course. Refer. Refer out. Yeah. It's like, the, and, and it's not all, only online, but I would see this in consultation groups as well. Right. Of course. Sure. 
there are some times when referring out or terminating is the answer. But it's the same thing when you complain about your job to your spouse and they're just like, well, why don't you just quit? Yeah. It's like, oh, thanks, Einstein. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I hadn't thought. I, I. So you're telling me that that's that's something that Americans can do is they can quit their job. I, I didn't. I didn't even know. Right. That was a thank you for alerting me. Or when you complain about your marriage, like, well, why don't you just get a divorce? Just leave them. It's like, oh, thanks, Einstein. Like I, I hadn't <laughs> considered that that possibility. Um, if and that's all that they say, yeah, you know, yeah, that, yeah that's right. all that the friend says, right? Right, it's like an episode of a you know, Jerry Springer or Dr. Phil or something, yeah, you know, oh, here's what you should do, and it's this stupid, oh, stuff. thanks. I uh, thought, but my, my impression was that the client quit therapy, no, the client up to <laughs> the, this point is resistant to making changes to the situation. Because, because <laughs> not only does the client enjoy living that, because that that's almost that's probably a more secondary issue. The client is a friend and and is depending. Right, right. That's right. That's right. I forgot on this, about that part. On this counselor, and they said terminate. The the did the is that well, what no, the colleague the, said? No. The, yeah. So so the the counselor, all they said was, I need to pull back. I and I think what the counselor, because it's not stated otherwise. I think all the counselor was saying is, look, you can live here, but we need to not be as involved. We need to not be so, you know, frequently communicating. There needs to be some boundaries around our communication, but you can still live here and you can still fix my house and you can still do the chores and I can still be your life coach, but we can't be you know, communicating as frequently as we have been and, and you can't be relying on me emotionally. And I'm guessing that's what he was saying because he, up until this point, there's been nothing in the brief about like, the counselor attempted to kick him out. Okay. Right. So the the counselor consulted with a colleague, and the colleague advised the counselor to terminate their relationship with the client. Oh, man. Which presumably means kicking him out, too. Kicking I don't know. Too. Yeah, right. Um, because there would be no longer a bartering agreement, so, you know, he would have to kick him out. It's weird advice because I don't see... It, it offers... It actually undermines protection, the, the therapist being protected from being sued. How so? Well, you're harming the client further. Mm -hmm. So, like, if the surgeon gets halfway through the appendectomy and says, oh, well, you know, I don't want to continue with this anymore. Get off my table. Right. Cause yeah. Because you, your anatomy is weird and I don't know how to deal with it, you know, like, sorry. Yeah. Um, but, um, the, but it just illuminates th the stupidity of the advice that I right. commonly hear. Yeah, exactly. It's just like, well, just terminate. And it's like... There's a whole section on termination in your ethical codes. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're just thinking selfishly, terminating a client against the client's will is one of the most common precursors to being sued or complained about. So even if you don't care about the client, which you should, but even if you don't, you should at least care about yourself. And if you don't play your cards right, you're almost guaranteeing at least, you know, what you're trying to avoid if you're just thinking selfishly is any kind of complaint. You're, you're, so, yeah, that's exactly what I thought was, look, the best case scenario for everyone, client mainly, and you secondarily, is you go on a campaign to transition this relationship back to a, a less risky place. You can't just rip the band-aid off here because that will harm the client and will open you up to a complaint so best case scenario one you never so this is what i would have said if i wasn't going to uh, well i guess regardless of whether or not i was going to report them i would say number one never do this again mm -hmm. number two there's something wrong with you like probably wrong with your personality that you need to get your get your head around because the thousands of choices that led to where you're at right now indicate something's something's wrong with you, which might actually pre preclude you from being a counselor to begin with. And I, I would give this some heavy thought. Right. And there's going to be likely other harms that are happening, maybe even right now to other clients, and most of those are going to go under the radar. And you just really have to go on a journey if, and this could take 10 years of you like figuring out what's wrong with you that led you down this road is it greed is it narcissism like you're above the law is it that 
you weren't paying attention in class? Um, <laughs> do you not have any sort of fear? Are you like psychopathic on some level? Like what's going on? Because something's wrong with you. You know, you're 30 years old. You're in the beginning of your career. Most people are overly paranoid. You're, or, or you're, you're, you're uh, privileging online advice about this because you know there are whole subreddits dedicated to this kind of stuff and the dominant voices along these lines of like, well, just offer life coaching, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, something wrong, some something's wrong, something's rotten in Denmark, and you've got to root root that out before. So that's one. Um, two. You have you have to go on a campaign to slowly transition this to eventual termination, right? And that could take years, so you can't change anything. In fact, you have to walk back what you already said to him about drawing a boundary. You have to start to slowly uh, transition. Like you know, this would just be one idea of you tell the client here's the timeline or here, here's what I eventually want to get to where you're living on your own and you have a therapist because I'm not your therapist. Remember that because you have therapeutic needs as a lot of people do and you have, uh, your career is going okay and you have support in your life and I am your life coach and we, do we go back to the very beginning where you know it's over video conferencing? I mean that that w- and and you know we'll stay in touch and I'll you know we'll have a lot of contact you know so you're establishing that you care. But that's why I want to get to not because I am rejecting you, but because it's you know in your best interest to have that well-rounded you know diversified attachment life you know. Yeah. And and then you and you might have to have a long conversation. There might be some adjustment even to you disclosing that to the client. There could be some hurt feelings. And so you have to start apologizing and not putting anything on them and certainly not bringing up ACA ethics because technically this isn't a counseling relationship. So stop saying that. Right. <laughs> Having said that, you need to start operating as if uh, the ethics are in play because they're at least a good guideline to follow under these circumstances. And you might have to deal with the fact that a client is living in your house and is bothering you, but you made your bed, it's time for you to sleep in it. So this could take another five years for your client living with you. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to have to suck it up because the client deserves that. And this could salvage your career. Mm -hmm. And you will definitely learn through experience never to do this fucking again. (laughs) You want this to sting so that you avoid this in the future. Um, that's what I would say. Um, instead, the colleague was like, yeah, terminate. Just, <laughs> yeah. just terminate. Right. <laughs> so I to say it out of mind. Uh, going on. The counselor also shared his concern to the consultant that the client was escalating emotional outbursts and the counselor suggested that the client may have borderline personality disorder. Oh. So now we're weaponizing the DSM. Yeah, but you know who knows. But it there are minor uh, things in alignment with this. That you had a client that comes talking about problems in their marriage and how they have anxiety and depression. That's situational. You know, as you were saying, that could be anybody, but also you know people with a personality disorder. Also, it. Uh, you know, smells like this. Smells like borderline spectrum. In that, the the counselor felt this savior complex, which therapists will often do Sometimes because the the, the client often will idealize the therapist, and the therapist will feel like a little god, like they can do anything and they can do no wrong. Yeah, an appeal to ego. Yeah, yeah, and you know, the closeness can feel good to a therapist like wow this client really depends on me and likes me and opens up to me and it just feels good to have that kind of authenticity or humanness or whatever and and those are all good things but without clinical understanding what i my problem with the suggestion that the client might be borderline is that's only useful 
in terms of coming up with a treatment plan to help somebody. Right. It's not meant to say, oh, yeah, you know, they're borderline and you know those people. Yeah. I need to get rid of them. Yeah. <laughs> so terminate because they're borderline. I have heard people do that. Oh, yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And with life coaching, what they will say is, well, there was no way for me to know that they had borderline when I first started working with them. And so it brings up this, so if you're just a life coach and you're not a counselor, like you're not trained as a counselor, then fine. Yeah. No one expects you to know that. No one expects you to treat that. No customer should expect that of you. And as long as you're advertising yourself effectively, then then say borderline symptoms emerge nine months in, then no harm, no foul. But if you're a trained fucking diagnostician, uh, you are able to see it. Right. And so this is another problem with the counselor life coaching thing is that you have a client that comes in and in order to avoid a situation where you have a borderline client that will present problems that you now are dealing with, quote unquote, as a life coach that are making it difficult to work with them, thus you have to terminate with them. That would mean you'd have to engage in a pretty robust screening process that could take weeks <laughs> to even determine if you can engage in life coaching. But in order to assess them, you have to assess them as a counselor because life coaches don't assess people's personality disorders. So it's a, this is another problem with, and, and, and another problem that I see independent of life coaching where there will be people that I will talk to or be online that will say, I don't work with people with borderline or I don't work with people that do this and that to me. You know, my client fell in love with me. I'm going to terminate with them, that kind of stuff. And, ridiculous. Yeah, totally ridiculous. And then what I would say to them is, okay, well, if that's your policy, I find that atrocious, but if that's your policy, you have to protect clients by screening out people with that potential, which means you have to engage in a pretty robust assessment process with literally every client because there's no way to detect someone with borderline or borderline tendencies um, in the first month of therapy. Right, you so know, good there, luck. There's no indication of that. So you have to have some magical way of determining that and... Uh, but there are ways of, uh, and you need to err on the side of of caution. And if someone shows even the slightest sign of being borderline, you have to refer them to someone else uh, before you even engage, or maybe in the first session. You know what I mean? At, you know, like you are clear with the clients. Look, th this is the first session of screening. This is, this is not the beginning of therapy, or you know, blah blah. blah. Um. And that would mean that you would have to refer out probably five times the amount of clients that actually have, you know, like for every borderline client that you refer out, you're referring another five to 10 other clients out who might have borderline, but you just can't tell because you just have to, you just have to apply this pretty liberally across a wide swath. That's the only way you can operate ethically in my book. Well, the problem with that is, that anybody who's doing this isn't going to have a robust ethical um, uh, inner compass. Right. So they're just shooting from the hip and doing what they want and blah, right. blah, blah. Right. Which brings me to another point of the problem with the counselor life coach thing is that if that's all I know about someone, if they are a counselor that provides life coaching, most of the time that indicates tip of the iceberg in terms of there's something wrong with that counselor's entire understanding of the profession. There are counselor life coaches that know what they're doing and are very good at what they're doing and understand that line. You know, like I know of counselors that provide life coaching services where they only provide life coaching services around career. Right. And it's just like five sessions and it's like a curriculum that they will bring people through. There's no emotion really there's no chance for transference to develop that kind of thing and they do that or they're really good with investments or something or they're really good with cleaning your house they're good with clutter you know and they offer that on the side and they're very clear about that there they are people a, that do that they have a firewall but most of the time the counselors that are providing live coaching 
are providing basically counseling and there's they're indistinguishable you know the 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 ethical counselor life coaches if you saw a life coaching session you and i would have no problem identifying oh that's a life coaching that that doesn't look like therapy that that's completely different from counseling so to me hearing about you know like i think in the episode where i went into detail about this i came to the conclusion that if someone came to me a friend and they said hey i'm a, i'm thinking about going to see this counselor and then i googled them and found out that the counselor also provided life coaching services on the side i would tell my friend avoid that person not because i know they're a problem i mean maybe they're not a problem maybe they're fine but on average they're probably a problem because it is the tip of the iceberg typically someone that is willing to cut corners someone that's greedy you know at no point in my career did i ever think oh no i can't pay my bills or i'm not making enough money or i'm not making the money that i wanted at no point that i think well how do i harm clients <laughs> to squeeze as much money mm -hmm. like that that's antithetical yeah yeah the yeah. vast majority of counselors i would argue err too much in this realm where they are self-sacrificial you know they they won't even raise their rates to keep up with inflation because they feel bad that's what most therapists are like but there's this increasing trend of the normal the normal what do you say the normalization of this life coaching thing because it's very convenient, particularly to novice clinicians that are trying to get their career going. And instead of doing what we all had to do, they take shortcuts. Anyway, so going on, mm -hmm. the counselor met with the client again outside of the home, setting, um, sorry, the counselor met with a client outside of the home setting to discuss his concerns about the ongoing boundary extensions and to refer the client for a mental health evaluation. So this sounds like the counselor's like, hey, I, I can't do this in the house because that's blurring the boundary, duh. So I'll meet with him outside. So he's like, hey, I need to make sure that I pull back on the boundary extensions and I need to refer you for a mental health evaluation. The client remained resistant and began exhibiting angry outbursts. I would say that the client deserves to be angry. <laughs> oh, I'm not. Yeah, this is this is evidence of being fucked with. Yeah, you're being suddenly like thrown around and rejected. You've been maybe not explicitly, but at least in terms of behavior, you're being treated like a friend, like uh, someone in his life. You live with him. You have this arrangement, and to suddenly have this, you know, you. you um, oh, the other sign of borderline spectrum is that the the transference of the idealization, you know, from spouse to the to the, you know, it's a fantasy that clients want to move in with their right. with their therapist. Sure, so, the perfect object, the perfect mother, would they call right. it? Yeah, right. Um, due to the client's desire for a personal friendship with the counselor, the counselor reiterated that he was unable to continue in the relationship. He further stated that he was severing all ties with the client and thus required the client to move out of his home. Oh, God. The counselor abruptly terminated the relationship, believing that they that there were no other options. Whoa. So the way this is written in the brief, I think it happened in this one meeting. Yeah, it sounds <laughs> After like he it. had this consultation. Right? right. Which I see happen. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll hear cases, people will email in or I'll see cases online where a therapist... A, you know, at the first sign of any kind of problem, we'll just email and say, okay, I'm terminating. And here are three names of colleagues that you can reach out to. And <laughs> it's like, there's a whole section on ethical termination. Anyway, going on after moving out of the counselor's home. So the, he, he did, the client began posting accusations of abuse about the counselor on social media, which I think is viable. It's It's true. Yeah, the people were, should be warned. They were abused, yeah. Yeah. The client had become aware of other clients who were being seen by the counselor, I'm guessing through social media, I'm not sure. Mm, oh. The client became aware of other clients who were being seen by the counselor and contacted them. Oh, contacted them. So I, I don't know what this means. It, 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 it makes me wonder if the counselor had given some indication as to who these other clients were. I don't know. 
But anyway, the client becomes aware of these other clients and the count, the, the client, um, what did I say? The client, the client became aware of these other clients and the client contacted these other clients in an effort to gain support for his personal vendetta against the counselor. I don't know why the brief, uh, says personal vendetta. Yeah. That's a bit loaded. Yeah. Um, the other clients did not respond. Approximately six months after the counselor terminated their relationship, the plaintiff, the client, filed a lawsuit against the counselor asserting the following. Improper management of boundaries, yes. Failure to adhere to state licensing statutes and regulations re, uh, related to interstate counseling, yes. Failure to conduct informed consent, yes. Failure to document informed consent, yes. Failure to initiate a timely referral for evaluation and treatment of borderline personality disorder. Uh, yeah, it's hard to evaluate that one, though, because it's such a weird situation. And also improper termination. Now, again, it really depends on experts' opinions as to whether or not this could reasonably be considered outside of counseling, which I'll get into in a second. The plaintiff, the the client asserted that he suffered emotional distress, depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances, and a loss of income as a result of the above noted assertions. I think this is reasonable. You know, I think that sometimes people throw around emotional distress as a way to just squeeze money out of uh, someone that you're suing, but I think this is le totally legit. Yeah, this would cause emotional distress. Yeah. In the, des in the deposition, in the client's de deposition, he testified that he believed that the licensed counselor was acting as his counselor despite signing an initial contract of life coaching sessions. So I, you know, I think what they found and I think what the client could demonstrate was, yeah, we signed this life coaching thing, but there were so many other communications and indications of this was a counseling relationship that, um, uh, I considered I considered him my counselor, not my life coach. It's sort of like everything but name. Right. Yeah. Which leads me to believe that the content of their sessions was much more emotional and yeah. Yeah. The client was able to demonstrate through expert testimony and evidence that the counselor was indeed providing counseling. Mm -hmm. The experts for the defense, so this is the this is the counselor's experts. So they look into it. And they look at all the data and the emails and the depositions and everything. And they conclude that they will not be able to defend the counselor's actions in court. I was surprised. I would be surprised if anything but that happened. Yeah. That's when you know you've, you've, you've done fucked up. Because if, you, if your own paid experts are saying, um, yeah, I can't, I can't even make up a spin on this story to make you look not liable. If I testify, it will go against you. Yeah. Yeah. The experts agreed that the client's assertion that the counselor was serving in the role of counselor was indeed true. Moreover, the counselor's actions failed to align with ACA ethics, which is obvious. <laughs> so, you know, once it's established that he's operating as a counselor uh, and has been communicating as a counselor, then all bets are off, right? The bartering, the living with him, the communications, the did -de, the experts highlighted the multiple emails authored by the counselor referring to counseling, you know, quote unquote, the word counseling the word, was being the word. used. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That's a... uh, the experts were critical of the counselor's statement indicating that he was working, quote unquote, under the guise of a life coach to justify out of state counseling. So this is their, the experts words are like, the counselor was operating under the guise, meaning he was uh, pretending to be a life coach just so he could provide out of state counseling, which I think happens a lot. Uh -huh. And, you know, just think about all the, all the people out there that are where this is happening, where the situation doesn't blossom into a situation like this. And you have harm that is happening to clients, or you have a counselor that, generally speaking, is cutting a lot of corners for money's sake, yeah. and is uh, never caught because there's there's nothing rises high enough, and or the client doesn't know to sue. You know. Um, anyway, although the experts believe that the licensed counselor's intentions were altruistic, 
They opined that the relationship was inappropriate and harmful to the client. The lack of documentation also presented a significant challenge to the defense of the case. Mm. Just chiming in here. Again, if it was live coaching, there is no, you don't have to document anything. <laughs> There's zero need for any documentation. So if it was live coaching, then okay. But if you're operating as a counselor, and arguably any counselor that operates as a life coach should probably engage in a shit ton of documentation uh-huh. just to make sure that oh. everything's covered. You yep. Know, going on. Other factors complicating the defense included the inappropriate bartering that took place and the abrupt termination of the established relationship was also concerning to the experts. The counselor acknowledged that he should have performed a more comprehensive mental health assessment, which likely would have limited or prevented the boundary extensions. So just chiming in here, I think what this is indicating in the brief is that the counselor was like, oh, this all could have been fixed if I had a comprehensive mental health assessment. You know, I was conducting a more typical uh, mental health. That's kind of what it sounds like to me. It sounds like the counselor still doesn't fucking get it. And they're just like, oh, okay. In the future, I'll just do a more comprehensive mental health assessment. That is the least of his problems, right? There are so many other problems here other than just he didn't do a longer mental health assessment. Um, yeah. It, it, in fact, it's so flimsy as a defense because you're not allowed to do a mental health assessment as a counselor for somebody who does not live in your state. Right. <laughs> Or doesn't or isn't in your state at the point at the time of service is really exactly yeah yeah. So the resolution was that the defense attorneys and the defense experts agreed that they shouldn't pursue this no contest. So they should try to settle, and there was a settlement that was negotiated. And how much do you think the client and the malpractice had to pay out? Over total, about fifty grand, more than three quarters of a million, seven hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Wow! Because he because he sued him, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. But the the when people the get typical sued yeah is pretty low. The client lived with the fucking counselor. Oh, okay, yeah, I get it. This was <laughs> not maybe your typical ethical violation or you know legal violation. Yeah, yeah. This yeah, and yeah. it is surprising that it was that much. Um, yeah, but three quarters of a mil makes sense to me. I mean, the amount of pain. I mean, this client might literally never go back to therapy again. Oh, I, I, yeah, right, yeah. And the client could be, you know, suicidal, triggered. I mean, the the betrayal. You know, even if the client doesn't have borderline, the betrayal to be led along like that, and and to have that best friend, father figure, or whatever it was. To just have that person just suddenly turn on you right. and be it's like, "Yeah, like, you're kicked out be- because this re- because you're too dependent on me. Get out of my house, and I'm terminating you as my client. I'm breaking up with you as my friend. You don't have a place to live. You're in a different state now. <laughs> you don't have a job, presumably, because that hasn't been on the table. And I don't want to ever talk to you again on a dime. You know what I mean?" Yeah, maybe three quarters of a mil sounds like a reasonable amount of money, but that person is hurt. Yeah. They're really hurt. Yeah. And that doesn't change, money ain't going to change that. Right. So I think this includes legal fees, which, you know, could be 50 grand or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not, they didn't detail all the money, but. And what, did any, any um, action on that person's license? Um, no, because this was a civil case. Uh, right. Well, well that there's this no was a civil case. This was this wasn't a licensing board case, so they they didn't uh, talk about the licensing board case they, if there was one. Yeah, they they I'm sure they dropped him. They 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 were not going to cover that guy anymore. Malpractice. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So stupid is a stu- stupid does. Um, what is the definition of that phrase of that idiom? Do you think? I don't know. I just know it from Forrest Gump, but I actually don't know what it means. What do you think it means? Because what what did it mean in Forrest Gump? How was it being used? Um, Mother, mama always said, "Stupid is stupid does." Well, um, Bubba's mom says, "Not Bubba." Yeah, Forrest. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, Bubba's mom. 
Yeah. Oh. Says to him, are you crazy or just plain stupid? Oh. And he says, stupid is as stupid does. Yeah. I think it means that... It was Bubba's mom? Well, the scene I'm thinking of, yeah. I don't remember. Because he shows Bubba's up and he's mom. like, he's like, I got this money and I'm going to buy a shrimp boat and I'm going to be shrimping. Oh, right. Right. And, you know, because that's what, that's what we were going to do. Okay. And she's like, are you crazy or just plain stupid? I forgot about that. Scene. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I think what it means is, um, you know, stupidity by um, how people behave. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's what it means. It's not based on. You can't judge a book by its cover. Like if someone might look like they're stupid, it what really matters is the way people live their lives and the overall outcome of things. You know, man. Um, you know, they might not talk like a like a professor, or they might not have fancy things or whatever. But um, that doesn't mean that someone isn't smart about their decisions or, or good about their decisions. So that doesn't really fit with what I'm trying to get at when I'm, you know, what I'm trying to get at is an idiom that points at when someone does something stupid in this category, you know, counselors, therapists that do one stupid thing, almost all the time, they're doing thousands of stupid things. So that's not what stupid is a stupid does. I mean, it kind of is, you know what I mean? It's sort of like, well... If we go with the opposite of what Forrest Gump is saying, it's like, well, no, it doesn't really fit because right. it's like it, this is you know, stupid is stupid does is more about judging a book by its cover right. in both directions. Like if someone on the cover looks like they're smart, but if you look at their actual outcomes, it's a lot of bad choices. Then that's one thing. So that's not really what we're talking about here, right? So I googled a lot of other idioms because it just seems like there's got to be some idiom that gets at this idea. Great. What do you got? Can, can you think of any off the top of your head? Yeah. Where there's You're smoke. really good at idioms. Where there's smoke, there's fire. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, but not exactly. No. Where but, there's but, fire, but that, but, <laughs> there's a blaze, man. But because normally where there's smoke, there's fire. Well, I, I, yeah, I guess that does fit. It it fits, but, but it implies that we don't know that there's actually fire. Right. Because where there's smoke, there's fire. Is right. we don't know there's fire. But this is this is a but, dumpster fire you, that's going to spread. So and, where there's a little fire, there's a lot of fire. Yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, right. It's more <laughs> but, like that. But but we don't. Uh, so can you think of other any other idioms? Because I, I have a list of five here that I found on Google. Not off the top of my head. What do you got? The first one is the first sign of a fool, oh. which I don't hear people saying very yeah, much. I don't know that one. But that is a phrase that's used in a situation like this. Um, like if there's an initial act of foolishness, then uh, right. there's sense. probably many more to come. And you can say that, but it, I don't know. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. The first sign of a fool. I mean, I guess it could like when I, when I go over these ethical cases, I'd be like, and here we have the first sign of a fool. The next idiom, a glimpse of things to come. <laughs> you hear that every once in a while, but again, not, yeah, not as pithy not, as it doesn't uh, have a punch to it yeah, in terms yeah. of and our specificity, right? Because right? that right. could apply to good things or yeah. whatever. Right. Uh so you have tip of the iceberg, but you also have tip of the dunce cap. Oh, I never heard that one. So this kind of gets at it. And you know, there's a whole discussion about like being mean to people that have low IQ. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about low IQ. I'm not talking about developmental disability. It's a completely opposite construct that I'm talking about here. When I'm talking about stupidity or tip of the dutz gap, I'm talking about someone that you know, you know, might be very smart on paper and might have a high IQ, but because of something that's wrong with their decision making process and their personality, they make choices. You know, these are, this is this counselor was presumably given the information and had enough to go off of to understand that what he was doing was wrong. It wasn't a lack of intelligence. It was foolishness or well, selfishness or something. Something was wrong with him that caused him yeah. to make a lot of really harmful decisions. Exactly that. It's, it's, so when I say foolishness or a dunce cap or, or stupid or moronic, as you were saying earlier, that is what we're talking because you know those words can mean a lot of different things. They are used to ridicule people of low IQ or people who don't have the 
cultural understanding of what you know like if you have a southern accent people will say you sound like a moron you know right, so right, right. that's not what i'm talking about because we don't really have a a language around well what do we call these people that make choices willingly that are very poor and are harmful and are done in a way that we should be highlighting, you know, with some sort of word. You there know? is an impairment here for sure. This is not like um, accidental. Right. Like this person has an impairment that set the table for this thing to happen long before it ever happened. Right. So tip of the dunce cap. I'm not a huge fan of that one because the dunce cap traditionally would be used to ridicule people perhaps of low IQ or people who have less education or something, you know. But to me, that one fits fits it the closest. Uh, you know, the first sign of a fool is pretty close. Glimpse of things to come, yeah. Tip of the dunce cap, though, that, that feels great, but I, I don't feel great about the phrasing. Another one, the first foolish step on a long journey. It's too specific to, like, you make one mistake and then it kind of blossoms into other mistakes. That's not really what this is. We, you just have someone that's operating from a place of a problem which produces problems. This you know? is the present. What, what's the, how's the idiom go? The first foolish step on a long journey. The present step. The present foolish step on a long journey is more like what's happening for that fella. Yeah. And the last one, the first note in a symphony of stupidity. Yeah, what I what I my objection to all these is they imply that this this is the first. This is not the first. Well, if we go to the begin like what I was googling was what idioms apply to a situation where you see one dumb thing and then later learn there's a lot of other dumb things. Right. So it was kind of what what I was um, getting at. And right, that right, is right. what I'm getting at in terms yeah, yeah. of the idiom of, you know, when I would say stupid is as stupid does, I'm saying if you see one bad thing, then almost all the time you're going to find a whole lot of whole, other bad things. Of, well, we need to either make well, if one we, up. So let's make one up. You're you're good. You're a, you're a writer. Oh, well, one of the pers- one of the people who uh, wrote on your birthday card, they say that they can tell you're a good writer because of the way that you phrase things. Just in life. Well, that's nice. Thank yeah. you. Um. Well, I don't know if I can come up with one on the spot. Um, usually what I do is I, I look for an image that is elicited by, you know, when I hear the story, what images get elicited? Like fighting couples, sometimes I'll imagine boxers in a ring. Um, so, um, let's see. For this person, I don't know, I'm not coming up with anything. Because the way I see them is, this is just the most recent or the present dumpster fire in a life that what I'm trying to do is create an idiom for us to, because idioms are like heuristics to life, right? You give them an inch and it'll take a mile. It's, it's a cautionary idiom. There's a message and you know, it's pros and cons, but, and there are bad idioms like once a cheater, always a cheater, that kind sure, of stuff. Sure. Sure. But the cautionary heuristic I want to create is if you find a therapist or you yourself as a therapist are doing X, then there's probably Y and Z and then A, B, and C. You know, it's not just that if there's bad documentation, you would say, well, there's just bad documentation. But in my experience, if there's bad documentation, there are 10 other very bad things. And when you add up all those very bad things, you have a lot of harm happening to clients. I'm trying to highlight that so that clients and counselors and trainers can understand that if you find something wrong, you have to be alerted that there's a good possibility there's a lot more, and therefore you have to be very scrutinizing of that individual. And if you're a counselor yourself and you start the slippery slope of engaging in some of these shortcuts and bad practices, then there's a pretty good chance that whatever led you to engage in that initial bad practice will probably motivate you to engage in a whole lot of other bad practices and then you'll end up in court and bad things will start happening to you so you need to address whatever is at the foundation of that initial bad practice that's what i'm trying to get i'm not trying to get at um, the end result i'm trying to get at at that initial detection phase 
So tip of the dunce cap or the first note in a, you know, like if someone, if I had a supervisee that had bad documentation, I'd be like, is this the first note of in a symphony of stupidity or, or what? What am I looking at, you know? Nothing happens in a vacuum. Eh, I don't love it. It's in um, the direction. But, um, you know, now I'm seeing dominoes fall. Mm -hmm. Like, look for the dominoes. Yeah, but that cause that that that's you know typically that's used in like causality, Causing, right, 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 like right. in like Vietnam following falling to yeah. the communists. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Got it. Got um, it. Uh, well, the something's way I'm rotten about in it, Denmark. I said that earlier. I, I kind of like that one. Oh, that one, that one works. Yeah, but not really. It's not super specific. But if it smells like something's if there's a bad smell, there's probably something rotten at its core. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are there any idioms that have to do with that? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> where, right, there, where there's a fart, there's poo? <laughs> right. Yeah. They're, right. That's good. There are idioms like that, right? All right. Let me ask. Other idioms like where there's a fart... There's poo. Let's see. Uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, no smoke without fire. Actions speak louder than words. Every cloud is a silver lining. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Can't make an oblig about breaking eggs. Mm. If it walks like a duck, cracks like a duck, it's probably a duck. That one works. Proofs in the pudding. There's no such thing as a free lunch. What goes around comes around. You reap what you sow. Um, no... Something more specific to when you see one problem is likely many more problems. Like a I think sign. I'm just getting back to the same Google search I was doing before. There's a like tip of the iceberg, rain pours. Yeah, Pandora's box. Uh, one rotten apple spoils the barrel. Mm. That applies to like multiple people, right? Yeah, that doesn't really fit. Scratching the surface. Mm. That one sort House of works. House of cards, snowball effect, domino, domino effect. Yeah, I just feel like there's just maybe not. But anyway, where there's where there's a because you know the smoke, fart, poo. It's a similar kind of metaphor. Yeah, but I like it better than the fire. Yeah, but you know what was it again? Um, wow. Where there's a fart, there's poo. There's poo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the first shart in <laughs> explosive diarrhea. <laughs> where, where there's a shart, there's diarrhea. <laughs> because I was trying to get away from, you know, fart. and Because sometimes fart is just a fart. There's always poo behind the fart, right? Sure. But farts don't necessarily mean, but, you know. Well, where, sister, where, for, where, what I say? Where there's a, a when, when there's a shart, there's, di there's, there's diarrhea. Yeah. My sister, um, was telling me a story once she was, you know, it was some, some day she's, she's at home with her husband and I guess he let one go and it was particularly stinky. <laughs> <laughs> and his comment was, oh, maybe this is it. <laughs> that came right off the turd. <laughs> <laughs> that came right off the turd. <laughs> what does that even mean? I think it means that, like, you got got stinky poo inside you, and this it's um, emanating gas or emanating stink. Well, since the lights are flickering, it's sort of like at the Oscars where they're telling you to get off the stage. <laughs> yeah. So let's wrap it up and say that that came off the turd and where there's a fart, there's poo. And when there's a shart, there's <laughs> diarrhea and everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. <laughs> <laughs>